when we start, everyone should keep their cameras off and uh, uh, except yes. me. Is that right? Except should... you. Except um, so that way, when we are live, it'll basically just be you. And then um, that way I can spotlight you right when I stop sharing the screen okay. um, for when I introduce it to you. OK, so, sounds good. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. All right. And just to clarify, we are linking adaptation and mitigation, right? The role That's of that. That's the one. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. That looks great. It looks much nicer than ours. I'm going out putting things up here on the screen. Sure. No, no not necessarily. Okay, we're going to be going live in about one minute. I will do a countdown just to start the webinar and I am going to turn off my camera <laughs> and I'll see you guys later. Okay, we are going live in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the first stream of our APAN conference on communities and local resilience. Um, that's the enabler, and um, oh, that's the stream. And the enabler, the, the enabler is policy and climate governance. Um, my name is Linda Stevenson, and I work for the Asia Pacific Network for Global Change Research. And today's topic is linking adaptation and mitigation, the role of national adaptation plan processes in NDC implementation towards climate action for inclusive and enhanced local resilience in South and Southeast Asia. Um, now, just let me share my screen and I will give you, okay. Okay, I'm sharing my screen, I think. Yes, all right. So um, again, there's our title. Um, I won't go through that again, but I'll move quickly on to our next screen. So let me just introduce um, introduce our session to you and what we want to do in this session. Um, we will look at uh, linking adaptation uh, and the role of NAP processes and NDC impl implementation towards climate action for inclusive and enhanced local resilience in South and Southeast Asia. Um, our session will introduce research and assessment uh, that consistently show the increased vulnerability of local and rural communities to the impacts of climate change and associated human security and disasters. 
Um, while local communities have adopted robust traditional resilience practices over the years, greater resilience is needed to tackle the impacts of climate change. And the Paris Accord or the Paris Agreement has room for ensuring that this happens, but will the implementation of national adaptation plans and nationally determined contributions or NDCs be sufficient to ensure adequate community resilience and adequate engagement? So with this background, we will address the importance of community and local resilience and the role of NAP processes and NDC implementation towards climate action for enhanced local resilience in South and Southeast Asia. Our speakers and panelists today are from a diverse range of institutions with different backgrounds and expertise. I mean, first from APN, we have myself uh, and we have our director, Mr. Genichiri, Genichiro, excuse me, Sakada, and um, Ms. Christmas Uchiyama, who will be my co-moderator for today. Um, our speakers are Ms. Vosita Wijinayake, who is the director of SICAN Trust, and uh, Dr. Shamik Chakraborty, who's senior researcher at Hosei University based here in Japan. Dr. Binaya Raj Shivakoti, who is a climate adaptation specialist at IGES, also based in Japan. Professor John uh, Juan Pulin of INREM at the University of Los Banos, the Philippines. Dr. Dipran, Dipran Day, who uh, is the chair of the South Asia Environment Forum. And last but not least, Dr. Hong, Dr. Kui Long Quang, excuse me, of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment Vietnam. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers for sharing their precious time today. And actually, I'd like to thank our rapporteur who came in at the last minute, um, Ernabisa Ismail, who, who will um, be taking our rapporteur notes for the day. So again, welcome everybody. So what are the objectives of our session today? We want to discuss the capacity building needs and priority issues in South and Southeast Asia to address NAPs and NDCs. We want to address critical questions related to those in the enabler of policy and climate governance for the community and local resilience stream. Uh, we want to look at the outcomes that are expected to address uh, gaps, challenges, opportunities and best practices. And finally, we will really want to provide information on capacity building needs um, and these are expected to be a key outcome of this session and how science, policy and action interlink interlinkages can be strengthened to ensure that the benefits pour rather than trickle into the local and community levels. So I hope that, that we will accomplish um, those objectives today in our session. But before we get started, um, it's always difficult with online meetings because we, you know, we find it very difficult to get that audience interaction. So. Um, before we get started, we would love um, our audience to join us via Mentimeter and um, to tell us a little bit about yourselves. So um, just moving on, if you could access, if you're on your mobile phones, you can access the QR code that's on the right of the screen here. Uh, that will take you directly to the Mentimeter um, page for this particular session. Um, you can also access uh, the Mentimeter link here and type in the access code, which is 25306304. And um, I think I'll give you maybe around 30 seconds or to one minute um, to do that. But meantime, also, you know, for, for questions for the speakers, um, we do really want a lot of interaction via Mentimeter and via the Q&A function on Zoom. And we hope that uh, we really look forward to your active participation. If you have any questions for the speakers, please use their names in front of your questions so that we can direct, um, direct the questions to the appropriate speaker and, and panelist. So with that, do you think I've given enough time for Mentimeter? Everyone is accessed? All right, so let's get going. So my first question to you all, and I really hope you've accessed Mentimeter, is uh, where are you from? Okay, here we go. East Asia, Oceania Pacific, other, South Asia. Mostly from East Asia and Southeast Asia are competing. Southeast Asia is up there. And here we go, we are equal, Oceania Pacific, others in South Asia. I wonder where others is from. I wonder how many participants we have. Okay, so 13 people seem to have logged on at the moment. I am going to have a little bit of a countdown 
on 30 seconds. I think the countdown is on. 30 seconds. Maybe not. Anyone else? 13 people? We must have more. Come on, you can get into Menti. Tell us where you're from. Okay, but it seems that we have, um, yeah, fairly broad interaction. We have a, we have four from Southeast Asia. We have, oh, we have five from Southeast Asia now. We have four from East Asia, two from other, three from other. We're still going. Maybe I'll give it another 30 seconds. This is fantastic. 16 people have responded. Maybe some people are still accessing, Ment accessing Mentimeter. This is a really great online tool um, to just establish, you know, some some uh, information on who's actually participating, since you can't really get to see each other, so it's it's kind of difficult. So anyway, let me move on to my next question. Um, so uh, let's see, what type of organization do you represent? I mean, you have a chance to put in two responses here. Okay, international regional organization, civil society, fantastic. We have four from the international regional organizations. Oh, youth, it's fantastic to see youth, even if we only have one at the moment. Ah, oh, we have two, fantastic. Multilateral organization, one, academia, one, local indigenous communities, fantastic. Thank you for joining us. So it seems that the majority, the majority of our participants seem to be from international and regional organizations and we have the private sector. Thank you for joining us. All right, so I'm going to move on to the next question. This is a really important question, guys, because you know I'm going to ask this question at the end of the session to see if your minds change at all. But here's a statement. Adaptation and mitigation synergy can aid community and local resilience building. I would like you to answer strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree, or not sure. That's great. So 38% and 31% are agreeing. 21% are not sure. We really hope we can change your minds by the end of this session. Um, no one disagrees, but 5% strongly disagrees. Let's hope we can change your mind by the end of the session. 38% strongly agree. That's really good to know. One, you know, we will be um, repeating this slide at the end of the Mentimeter um, presentations. And hopefully we can convince you um, otherwise, especially the 24% that are not sure and the 4% that strongly disagree. So moving on, another one. Oh, I don't think this is the one that I'm supposed to be showing right now. So I think I will stop, stop sharing my screen. Let's see. Stop sharing. So now I would like to invite our speakers to present. And um, first up is Ms. Bosita Wijinayaki. She works as the Executive Director of Slycan Trust based in Sri Lanka. Um, the Trust is a non-profit civil society think tank that focuses on climate change, sustainable development, biodiversity and ecosystem conservation, animal welfare and social justice. Bosita is also an international lawyer specializing in public international law and has over a decade of experience in working on climate change at national and international levels. Um, before Bosita comes on, her inspirational statement is resilience is not true resilience unless it is inclusive and participatory. And Vasita, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you, Linda. I will quickly share my screen. I hope you can see my screen. If you can put it up, fantastic, thank you. Okay, um, so I will be speaking about how NAPS and NDC synergies uh, work uh, in bringing uh, or building resilience at local level and then how um, the work can be scaled up to benefit policy decisions as well as um, actions on the ground. 
Uh, most of the work that I've been talking on is based on one of the research projects that we did with APN uh, and with local partners in Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka was like interest and the regional was also like interest. In Bangladesh, we had ICAD and in Nepal, Pakrit Resources Center. Um, so I will focus um, from the research findings on gaps and needs to be addressed for the implementation of NDCs, uh, entry points and components to build and enhance the potential of countries uh, to develop the NAPs uh, where they have not got NAPs or to review and have uh, NAPs enhanced where they have because Sri Lanka has the NAP at the moment. Uh, and then also the integration of SDGs and other international processes like the Sendai framework uh, into the NAP and NDC process. Uh, and also the integration of risk management, which is a key component of resilience building and how this can be integrated into the NAP process as well as the NDCs in countries. Uh, then looking at NDCs, NAPs, and how the international processes which we mentioned align and how they can all be uh, integrated without having duplications uh, in actions and the gender responsive aspects. So in addition to having three country uh, papers on this front and a comparative regional uh, paper, we also had knowledge products uh, in, um, which were focused on the components that I just mentioned. And then when, spoke, um, when we're speaking about benefits of aligning NAPs, NDCs, and, this, and building synergies around these international processes, such as SDGs and Sendai framework, uh, we noticed that it avoids duplication of actions, as I mentioned, as well as the financial investment to do the same action in different processes. So for example, if you're working on adaptation and resilience building um, in the NAP, as well as NDC, these being similar or uh, working together to ensure that the two processes or the two policy actions are integrated would avoid um, wasting money at country level as well as local level. Uh, and then being able to prioritize the actions and align the multiple processes, uh, which would allow us to scale up actions. Uh, and also, uh, we also uh, we noticed that data gaps uh, exist in many of the countries that we work in. And gaps in evidence-based actions that would facilitate adaptation measures to be um, participatory, inclusive, and also building community resilience. Um, so working in tangent with um, NAPs, NDCs, SDGs all together uh, would allow us to have data portals, uh, data systems that would contribute to having adaptation action, actions and resilience-based actions, uh, which are evidence-based as well as scaled up. Um, and also strengthening institutional coordination because coordination gaps uh, human resources gaps were some that were highlighted in the consultations we had in these countries um, and seeing synergies would help to, uh, to enhance the institutional capacities in the countries and uh, not having ad hoc um, coordination and institutional capacity building uh, that is focused on. Uh, then stakeholder engagement because there would be um, a streamlined process, um, synergized process and stakeholders would know what's happening and then participate reactions and inclusive actions could be developed, as well as um, how uh, we can have better structured capacity building processes. So for example, the research that we did identified capacity gaps, which uh, contributed to the NDC process at country level, because in Sri Lanka, for example, the consultations we did to identify gaps and needs fed into the NDC review process that's happening at the moment. And also the enhanced MRV processes based on the data gaps identified, um, coordination mechanisms for data management that were needed. So um, how can we scale up local resilience? Um, so some of the things that we can look at is through NAP and NDC process, the risk mapping and risk management exercises that can happen. Uh, so these would help us to identify what uh, needs are the, at community level, and we can work with community-based organizations, youth, women, um, vulnerable communities to identify these in participatory ways. Uh, and then national and local coordination, coordination mechanisms. So for example, if I take Sri Lanka or even Nepal, how local level actions could be integrated with the national planning process. Um, and that could be through NAP or the NDC. And then at the moment we're doing another project which allows uh, district um, level actions um, to be um, aware of the NDCs that are there in the country. Uh, then engagement of grassroots actors in the process uh, because uh, enhanced stakeholder engagement would allow this to happen. Uh, then technology, um, so for example, NDCs as well as the UNFCCC uh, reporting processes like the national communications could also be useful for this. 
Um, then piloting adaptation actions to see how some of the actions that are integrated in NDCs and NAPs could be successful or not. So context-based piloted actions could help us to enhance actions at national as well as sharing experiences across the board uh, on adaptation actions at local uh, level targeting sure, uh, sorry targeting um, resilience uh, so for example forestry biodiversity oceans based actions um, have been taken up by the Nabi work program of the UNFCCC and these connect with NAPS and NDCs as well um, similarly other regional processes of knowledge sharing like upon quorum as well as other webinars that different organizations do contribute to this as well um, then identifying and applying contextualized adaptation actions, which are gender responsive, would be also helpful. So uh, those are the things I want to highlight, but I'd be happy to elaborate on this further uh, when we have question and answer session. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much, Bosita. I really appreciate that. Um, key message, evidence-based inclusive actions through NDCs and NAPs contribute to strengthening local and community resilience. Um, I hope our, our um, audience can keep that in mind when we ask some more questions on Mentimeter later. Now moving on to our second presenter, um, who is uh, Dr. Shamik Chakraborty. He is a lecturer at the Department of Sustainability Studies, Hosei University in Japan. Before this, he worked as a JSPS UNU postdoctoral research fellow at the United Nations University Institute for the Advanced Study of Sustainability in Tokyo, uh, and was a visit visiting research fellow at the Integrated Research System for Sustainable Sustainability Science, actually, which is now known as the Institute for Future Initiatives at the University of Tokyo. Um, I love uh, uh, Shamik's um, inspirational statement. The world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. And that is a quote by Albert Einstein. And Shamik, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, fantastic. So I'm trying to share my screen now. Hope you can see it we can see it you just need to put it into present oh, that's perfect yes yes now it's in presentation mode so um time is very short but uh you know i will try my best to be short and precise and then uh, as Vasita, you know explained we can have question and answer we can uh, you know explain more uh, during the question and answer session so I have been working with this project on the uh, EBA or ecosystem-based adaptation to climate change. So it's, my research falls uh, more towards the adaptation spectrum than, than mitigation, but it's linked together. Um, I'm, I'm a lecturer at Hosei University in Japan and, and working as a PI, uh, working mainly with the University of Dhaka in Bangladesh and an NGO called Unan Onnashan, which has a long, like 20 years long experience with the you know, IPLCs, indigenous people and local communities in, in Kwaira subdivision in Bangladesh. Today, I'll present a part of that case. And I'm also working with uh, uh, the Indian Institute of Technology, Rurki India and Pokhara University in Nepal. So, um, Today I will uh, cover, try to cover the case, some parts of the case study in Bangladesh and how we are dealing with this. So, uh, you know, climate change, we are dealing with the topic of climate change and it is a classic, classic example of, uh, you know, uh, societies getting decoupled from nature. So that this is what climate change uh, tells us. This is one thing climate change tells us, how societies are de being decoupled. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm trying to find out how we can, you know, better synergize through a knowledge system so that this decoupling effect gets reduced or we can, you know, recouple back in a step-by-step -step process. And I'm dealing with local and traditional and local knowledge system uh, because uh, yeah, as many of us know, where, you know, these traditional local people live, they, they carve out a livelihood from uh, the intact ecosystems and are better coupled than, you know, the urbanites. That's the, in general, that is the understanding through you know, many years of research. So, uh, so I am also using uh, the theory of social ecological systems and uh, particularly looking at the case of uh, TLK, which is arguably, you know, um, a, a lot available uh, in the Sundarbans ecosystem, the mangrove ecosystem, one of the largest mangrove ecosystems in the world. 
what I'm trying to, what we are trying to do here is uh, valuing the landscape through TLK. It's a perception-based valuation. So what we are trying to do is, uh, you know, probe deeper into the qualitative understanding of ecosystem mangroves and then quantifying through GIS and, uh, you know, socio-cultural valuation tools. So uh, the thinking is like this, the landscape valuation can quantify and systematize qualitative TLK for TLK based and uh, ecosystem uh, TLK backed, I can say, and ecosystem service based management of ecosystems, which is a, a necessary step for EBA or ecosystem based adaptation and can buffer because it can buffer the effects of climate change. So the idea is keeping, keeping all the pieces together as far as much as possible keep the you know, large sinks of carbon uh, intact, keep the ecosystems intact so that livelihoods can be acquired, you know, knowledge is, uh, does not get reduced. And it also can, the, you know, the forest can also act as a climate change, you know, carbon sink, I'm sorry. So uh, in all these landscape valuation can connect to all these things uh, and lead to a local scale solution for, uh, to climate change. And it can inform EBA enabling activities as for example, the NDCs and NAPs through uh, EBA on ground-based activities uh, as for example, the research to tap the you know, traditional and local knowledge. Uh, what we uh, you know, did in the last few months uh, is uh, asking different landscape values from four different resources or communities, fishers, crab collectors, woodcutters and honey collectors who use the forest. And as, as you can see, if you overlay these, I have not done it here, but if, if you overlay these maps, you will see the forest and the river systems are, you know, used a lot, used a lot, right? If we overlay these, map, these maps. But, but one important thing is that they are going for, you know, crab collectors are just going for crabs, woodcutters, mangrove poles, honey collectors, honey, fish, fishers, uh, you know, take different types of fishes, but these three groups, are, you know, have a, a very low amount of, uh, you know, impact on the, on the forest. They are taking uh, some single species or several single species. So very selective resource use uh, is a characteristic of these mangroves. Uh, we also, uh, you know, ask the respondents about their importance of their ecosystem. And you can see that the natural beauty, life and livelihoods and religious and spiritual, these three values came up really uh, starkly through the, the, through the focus group discussions. And these, it is here that, uh, you know, the mangrove forest, the intact mangroves through the mindset of locals uh, are connected with the locals livelihood. I mean, connected with the locals through the livelihoods. So as for example, when we uh, talked about the combat, com climate change um, mitigation uh, capacity of these forests, as you see, quite interestingly, uh, they say it's somewhat important. So it, it didn't hit this uh, highly important mark. And that kind of surprised me a little bit. Uh, but uh, of course, th we have some background that large cyclones also hit the area like cedar and uh, Isla in 2007, 2009. So they have kind of a, maybe some opinions are, you know, uh, kind of mixed opinions were there because of these large storms, you know, devastating the village landscapes. But we see, uh, you know, very strong uh, sense of natural beauty of the forests, intact forests. And the forests are, you know, spiritually connected with uh, the people. Nick, you have 30 seconds. Island. Sorry? You have 30 seconds, please. Okay, yes. So this much for now. And I'm also looking forward to question and answer session so that I can uh, you know, explain things more. Thank you, Linda. Thank you so much, Amik. And sorry for interrupting you. Um, it's no one problem. of the worst things in the world as a moderator. Um, so I, I think mm -hmm. the important key message was understanding the importance of local scale solutions and traditional knowledge for climate change adaptation and landscape valuation can lead to local scale adaptation mitigation synergy. Um, and these are case studies in South Asia. I would like, now like to um, invite um, Dr. Binaya Raj Shivakoti um, 
Benaya works at IGES in Japan, and he's currently engaged in designing capacity building approaches for climate change adaptation, mostly focusing on local level resilience building. He's also promoting indigenous and local knowledge for climate change adaptation, as well as local level disaster risk reduction and climate change integration. And his inspirational statement, we are living in a new era, era in which rapid adaptation is not an option, but a prerequisite for transformation into a resilient society. So Benaya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Linda, very nice for, for your nice introduction. Uh, so with, uh, I think considering time, let me start sharing my slide. Can you see my slide? Yep, all good. Okay, let me start. Okay, so today I will be uh, mainly speaking about our experience on this uh, implementing APN capacity building project, capable you may know all know, on focusing on forest sector NDC implementation in Nepal. Uh, it's jointly implemented by IGS, uh, University of Southern Queensland, and involving many officials from the Ministry of uh, environment and for forest and environment and also provincial government and this is this also builds on IGS work uh, since 2011 on action research in Nepal so uh, in this uh, presentation uh, I would like to make uh, mainly three points the first about uh, why forest sector on the adaptation mitigation and adaptation second about the capacity gaps and uh, how third is how we can address the capacity gap, especially through education about education and technical capacity at the local level or community level so you know like a forest is a kind of a one example of a nature-based solution so it's a it has not only carbon uh, like a, uh, it is a carbon both sink and source and sink adaptation disaster uh, risk reduction and uh, through its ecosystem services it supports a lot of livelihood biodiversity ecosystem indigenous and traditional knowledge but uh, the one problem we have is uh, uh, on the opposite because it's our uh, sheer negligence or that it has become uh, one of the top uh, GHG emitter and its potential sink potential remain largely untapped and adaptation benefits are really underappreciated. So, uh, and in the Paris Agreement also, there is a mention about this uh, mitigation, joint mitigation and adaptation. And Nepal is a pioneer country, uh, which has uh, done this community-based forest management over 40 years. And in its NDC, there is a mitigation and adaptation-friendly uh, forest management is a prioritized. The role of uh, community is uh, kind of uh, considered very important, but for communities uh, tapping this climate benefits from um, forest is still a high hanging fruit. So then comes uh, what are the capacity knowledge and capacity caps we are talking. So first uh, is about the uh, uh, understanding what are the NDCs and subsequently what will be their position in the NDC, which is on uh, NNAP which is under development, and what are the accepted roles of community for and the cost and benefit of their participation and what are the risk of non-participation. Then only comes the local readiness. And we identified the three types of capacity. One on how to assess adaptation, how to assess mitigation, carbon source and sink management. And third is the critical part is uh, governance. And the uh, uh, next point uh, I would like to then uh, uh, come to is like a, uh, what needs to be done for mainstreaming uh, adaptation mitigation. So uh, the point here is like there are communities are exposed to several initiative, uh, but uh, local mainstreaming is a big problem. And for community, it doesn't matter whether you say adaptation, mitigation, whatever language you talk, but for them, what matters is the services it provides, what are the economic benefits, what are the resilience building option, at the end, that's what we need to address. And for that, uh, we come up with, uh, with found out that's uh, an integrated assessment, planning and implementation is needed to address the capacity gap. So that means like uh, how to conduct this kind of uh, 
community biomass monitoring, uh, how to plan and implement uh, community-based adaptation action, and how to assess the quality of governance. We talk a lot about governance, but we don't know how we can assess the government. So we propose a kind of a, there is a need to do this quality of governments. So the key idea is not, uh, maybe it's not necessary for the communities to know all the technicalities, but for them to know the steps, how they can take it, execute, and most importantly, communicate them with the, like the upper uh, levels. So for example, from uh, community levels to the national and international level where there is a huge gap. So I'd like to stop here and maybe uh, would like to talk if there is opportunity for in during Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you so much, Benaya, for a great presentation. And from that, I got the importance of education and technical capacity for reporting and scaling up adaptation mitigation in the forestry sector. And really importantly, the quality of governance as related to mitigation adaptation synergy through integrated planning and implementation, which is crucial, I think, for this, uh, this dialogue that we're having today. I'd now like to move on to our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Professor Joan Poulin, who um, was a former Dean of the College of Forestry and Natural Resources, the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. He holds the highest rank of UP scientist third since 2011 in recognition of his scholarly outputs and international scientific standing. Um, it's great, it's a great pleasure to have such a champion on board. And um, for an inspirational quote, uh, Dr. Poulin, Professor Poulin, I should say, believes that capacity development of local government units is the key to building climate resilience at the local level. Well, Professor Poulin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Linda, and good afternoon from my side uh, from the Philippines. Uh, so what I will be sharing in a few minutes is actually a very innovative uh, uh, program that was supported by APN in terms of building institutional capacity of local government units in the Philippines uh, towards cli uh, enhancing their climate risk resilience. And that's uh, actually the title of the presentation. So the major driver for this is the fact that uh, uh, we have experience as well as the literature attests very strongly the fact that disaster can be partly interpreted as a consequence of institutional failures. That's on the negative side. But on the other hand, Avoiding disasters and being more prepared and more robust and more resilient can also be interpreted in terms of a robust institutions. And so this is essentially the main argument of this particular capacity development initiative that APN has uh, really supported. Uh, and so we are drawing from the Institute of uh, Social and uh, Ecological Transitions uh, Framework. We build on it, uh, where on the one hand, uh, we want to understand risk and vulnerability uh, by looking at different agents, particularly local communities. That's why uh, we are focusing on local communities uh, and what happens to them in terms of resilience building but at the heart of this is really the role of local government units, which are main institutions at the local level to enable local resilience building. And essentially, we also look at institutions like uh, uh, infrastructure, but also your biophysical aspect, like forest uh, rich to reef approach and understand uh, risk and vulnerability along that aspect and uh, use that as a basis for building resilience. So uh, uh, after having understood the, the risk and vulnerability involved using a combination of local knowledge, but also scientific knowledge, then we then engage the local government unit uh, in terms of an exercise of developing their local climate change action plan, uh, 
uh, so that uh, they do not only understand vulnerability and risk, but they are able to address them through a more robust preparation of uh, a development uh, a plan, which we called here as a local climate change action plan. So uh, very quickly, the objective of the project is to enhance climate resilience in one, provinces, uh, one province in the Philippines called Aurora. It's uh, really very one of the more vulnerable provinces in the country by developing the capacity of local government personnel at the provincial and municipal levels by engaging them in actual preparation of local climate change action plan or in the Philippines, we called it LCCAP. LCCAP is very, very important in as much as it is a strategy document that uh, describes measures and policies of local government units in terms of how to reduce greenhouse gases emission, but at the same time, how to increase the capacity of local communities to be more resilient to climate change. So this is really along the lines of linking adaptation and mitigation. And uh, a major uh, tool to that is really the preparation of what we call LCCAP or Lo Local Climate Change Action Plan. So uh, we signed memorandum of agreement uh, with the local government units uh, that they will have counterpart funding and also really support the process. And of course, with the support of APN, we engage, uh, we created a technical working group uh, in seven municipalities and also at the provincial level. We conducted together with them uh, in a more participatory approach, participatory vulnerability assessment, a series of training, and also prepare a quite technical document, which is called community, uh, uh, climate and disaster risk assessment, which is really the input for local climate change action plan. And these are all uh, informed by institutional capacity assessment that we conducted at the Dr. earlier Colin, part. Can you finish in 30 seconds, please? Yes. Uh, so we have three key lessons learned here. The importance of multi-stakeholder approaches, the importance of institutional capacity development to improve human resources, increase financial resources, and enhance this database, the importance of integrating science and traditional and local knowledge, the crucial, the importance of time, and also the importance of scaling up for greater impacts. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pullen. I'm sorry for pushing you there. Um, I got one key message from your presentation. Institutional capacity development of local governments is needed towards climate risk resilience and improving human resource and staffing to assess risks and vulnerability and engage in resilience building. Um, increasing financial support from other sources is also required. Um, okay, so um, now we're going to move into the Q&A session. Um, if you have any question and answers from our, uh, for our speakers, uh, now is the time. We don't have any Q&A just yet, but we do have 66 participants. So I'm hoping that at least one of you has a burning question that you might ask uh, one of our panelists. Um, meantime, while we're waiting for Q&A, let me just pose um, one question to um, our speakers. It will be a question uh, I'll just pick at random. Um, let me ask uh, Vosita. So Vosita, if you could respond to this question, what is a difficult challenge or barrier in linking adaptation and mitigation for community and local resilience building? Thank you, Linda. Um, so I guess one of the key challenges is that communities don't separate these actions as mitigation and adaptation, right? So the technical skills to have um, co-benefits or synergized actions would be important and, and the guidance given by civil society organizations or other actors 
so that the skills to do these activities um, exist among the communities. That, that could be one challenge that I would feel as uh, like something very important. And also um, the urban aspiration, the important and the communication on these and evidence that exists that can be integrated into these actions when they are being planned and how that can be monitored and evaluated. So technical scale would be one uh, thing that I would focus on uh, to ensure that these actions are uh, implemented in a okay. scaled up and efficient manner. Okay, thank you so much, Basita. Um, I don't see the question, Chris, but I will pose the same question to Dr. Binaya. So let me repeat the question. What's a difficult challenge or barrier in linking adaptation and mitigation for community and local resilience building? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Linda. I think the first point I would like to second the yes, previous uh, speaker, uh, uh, who says that uh, we, the communities doesn't differentiate between mitigation and adaptation. For them, it's thing. I think the key barrier I would say is a uh, communication. So one aspect is that uh, uh, from the when we talk about NAP and NDC, they are very advanced topic for the community. So it's usually rarely goes down, trickles down to the community level. That's a one big barrier, how to transfer such kind of uh, information or opportunities, I would say, opportunities or risk as well. Not only opportunity, there are also risk. And uh, because if government uh, takes certain action, there might be some negative consequences to the community. Second is how this community-led efforts are recognized by the government. So there is a need for a capacity for the community to demonstrate and so what they are doing and efficiently able to communicate with those to the upper level. So that's, I think, the main barrier I think we are facing. Yeah, I would stop here. Thank you very much. I think you are muted, Linda. Thank you, Benaya. <laughs> It's always a fatal mistake, isn't it? Um, we have one question from an, an anonymous attendee. Um, how could governments address gaps in adaptation implementation locally? Now, I'm going to open that to the floor. So the first person to turn on their mic can answer that question. I'll repeat, how could government address gaps in adaptation implementation locally? Professor Pullen, I see you've unmuted yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Linda, and thank you so much for that very nice question as well. Uh, I, I'm coming from the context of the Philippines because uh, when we talk about government, there are a number of layers and those are very crucial to, to understand. Uh, at the higher level, uh, at the national government, they can create an enabling policy uh, so that adaptation uh, can be mainstream, can be implemented. They can provide a lot of support, uh, both technically, uh, but also financially. But at the local level, and this is where we are coming from, capacity development is of paramount importance. Uh, and in fact, I, I would say a key driver really uh, for enhancing local resilience because uh, uh, communities at the forefront are actually at the forefront of uh, uh, building uh, resiliency, uh, but uh, very close to the community are the local government units. Uh, and so uh, this is where now uh, the crucial role of local government units comes in, in terms of, I would say, empowering local communities. So not unless you have a very uh, capacitated local government units uh, that can really support uh, local communities, then uh, it will be a great challenge to enhance local adaptation. So uh, that's it for my, for my side. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Pullen. We really appreciate that. Um, we do have one other question. Uh, what are some points to consider when linking adaptation mitigation to the management of local social enterprises. And I'm actually gonna ask that to Dr. Shamik since uh, I haven't asked you a question yet during this uh, speaker's discussion. Thank you, Linda. And uh, thank you for 
I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the very nice question. Um, you know, adaptation and mitigation. For, I can uh, try to answer this through my case study, actually. Uh, my case study, I mean, our case study uh, tells me that uh, giving voice to, you know, indigenous peoples and local communities can be one way one point and uh, it is a kind of inter interesting landscape because you know this uh, probing this uh, knowledge base or you know co uh, creating landscape together with uh, indigenous and local communities has been touched uh, recently especially after the ipbs i think many of us know this uh, but how this knowledge system sits on the present academic uh, approach we have and, and the present policy approach we have to climate change and also other, you know, uh, environmental problems we have in today's world is kind of, uh, you know, uh, still needs to be probed at. So uh, sometimes uh, there are large, large gaps in the policies, how this knowledge can be integrated into the policy process. So one way the researchers uh, we can do is giving voice, give, uh, you know, uh, quantify, uh, landscape values, quantify values, uh, link with the ecosystem processes and these kind of, uh, you know, indigenous and local knowledge systems so that it becomes scientific, it, it touches science uh, so that some, uh, you know, land use interventions can be, you know, uh, tried. And uh, we can touch the landscapes, in my case again, uh, that connects this adaptation and mitigation as, for example, if you remember the Radar chart, there is a lot of you know use values from these forests, but there is a lot of spiritual values and beauty right. values related to aesthetics of the forests. And it is here that intact forests can be huge carbon sinks. In Sundarban, some studies found mm -hmm. that uh, you know uh, above soil and below soil uh, holds about 91 million tons of carbon. So that carbon is going to get lost if we lose these forests. Uh, you know, it's not only ecosystem, it's also the soil complex below holds a lot of carbon, actually more than it is on the top. So, uh, and this is connect, this connects to people through, you know, livelihood acquisition. There's a lot of use values involved. Uh, so this is the adaptation and mitigation. We don't, we, we lose the livelihood values, we lose the ad adaptation, the resilience of the community. So they are going to be refugees, climate refugees going somewhere else, and then they cannot use their knowledge they become more poorer, right? Mm. So, so this is the classic case of what is happening in Bangladesh. It will happen because Bangladesh is one of the you know, low, low lying countries in the world. And it is going to have the full scale impact of climate change, the sea level rise. Um, mm. You know, through my case study, this is the point I can share. Thank I you so much. Yeah, thank Part of your Sorry, course. I had un unmuted and was mentioning a comment to my colleague. I do apologize. But no, that's great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shamik. I really appreciate it. Um, we are running a little bit behind, so I'd like to speed things along a bit and move into our panel discussion. And we do have, um, I mean, in this panel discussion, we have our speakers, but we also have two panelists who haven't had the opportunity to speak yet. Um, and I would like to pose a, a question um, to, to Dr. Dipuan He and to Dr. Uh, Long Kong Hui and ask them to respond in inside two minutes, uh, each using their specific case studies. So first of all, my question to you both is in the context of your work and your case studies, um, again, what is a difficult challenge or barrier in linking adaptation and mitigation for community and local resilience building? And Dr. Uh, Dr. Day, I believe you have a short presentation, so if you would like to share your slides. Sure, Linda. Uh, should I uh, start the slides right now? Yes, please do. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I hope you can see the one. Yes, we can see them. Okay, yep. uh, very, very good afternoon from India. And it was really a nice discussion and I wish we could have uh, much more of time to discuss this very potential question of linking adaptation and uh, uh, mitigation together. 
Uh, I would be spatially speaking from a point of view uh, wherein uh, India as a, as a big uh, landmass and a big mass of people and big, uh, say, policy uh, designer is concerned. And I will just focus down to a very small aspect uh, as a window to look into this particular problem of linking adaptation and mitigation together. And this small aspect is taking a very large shape these days, and that is about the stubble burning. A uh, <clears throat> lot of agricultural waste is unmanaged, and finally it goes into the soil as ash because these are burned on the field itself. So with the support from Asia Pacific Network for Global Change Research, uh, we did a project uh, which came out successfully with a number of learning. Uh, I, I would call it uh, adaptive learning, uh, wherein we found that if we can use this agricultural wastes uh, in different, uh, say, uh, form and feature, like if it is being used as mulch or it, if it is turned into biochar, anything other than ash, and it is added to the soil, uh, then probably the soil function increases the biological activity of the soil increases, and that reflects as a huge uh, increase in the production and a very win-win situation in managing the West as well as supporting uh, the poor marginal farmers. Now, this intervention actually reduces emission, uh, agricultural emission, uh, which is a major concern these days. And at the same time, uh, it is also a big uh, reason behind air pollution in the Indo-Gangetic Plain, which is coming from the Northern Indian uh, part of the subcontinent and moving down as a, a long uh, transport uh, pollution, even down to uh, Dhaka. So that's a major concern. And we wanted to uh, trigger into that. We found that if these type of practices are recommended, adaptive farming practices are recommended, wherein the agricultural waste is used for uh, say mulching, or it is used as biochar in the field in, the, in uh, specific proportions, of course, and also as, uh, say, uh, say organic waste uh, or, or, say, organic manure. It depends on the agricultural waste type. Like in uh, Bhutan, we used it uh, as the raw waste from the uh, horticultural fields, and that came out to be a very good, uh, say, organic manure. But when it comes to stubble in, uh, say, or the bagasse in sugarcane, or rice, I think there are different uses for that. Biochar is a very wonderful use for that. And this could uh, definitely help the poor farmers. Now, <clears throat> when we come to the linking of adaptation and mitigation, I was just listening to the different discussions. What I personally feel that if we look from the, um, from the window of the marginal commons, what happens at the community, at the beneficiaries? So what we find is adaptation is basically uh, developing a, a sort of a habit, uh, which will be sustainable, which is long-term, and that refers to the resilience of the community. But whenever we talk about this habit, definitely there comes in an opportunity cost. Now the question comes that how to compensate this opportunity cost. So what we usually try to do is we try to compensate this from the payment of environmental services and uh, that is uh, not very tangible in one way. A lot of calculations are needed for that. And even with, again, uh, with uh, APN support, we are trying to develop a module to uh, calculate the economic value of these ecosystem services so that the opportunity cost can be calculated in that way. So that is what we talk about adaptation. And when we talk about mitigation, it's a quick relief. And it uh, takes a lot of time uh, to tickle down to the bottom. Just one small case study I'd like to give you. So water and energy. Often we find the poor there, say, uh, trapped in this water energy nexus. So if we say that, fine, uh, we will put in solar uh, as a mitigation, uh, say, effort, and we will take the, say, adaptability to, uh, I mean, uh, say, uh, budgeting the energy or budgeting water at the community level, usage at the community level, uh, then that adaptation will take a bit of a longer time rather than a quick relief of say energy uh, deficiency by it, uh, converting it uh, to solar or renewable energies. So this, uh, there is a point where we find that money definitely matters. 
and it matters both to the policymakers as well as uh, to the communities. Now, another important thing is the policy. Now, how the government or the stakeholders are looking at it. So, for example, India uh, has a commitment of 3 billion metric ton of CO2, uh, say, uh, abatement by 2030. Now, when it looks into the emission factors, it finds that the energy sector is having the maximum, like, say, 51, 52%. Whereas if, if it comes to agriculture sector, it is around 17, 18%. So definitely as a policy point, it goes towards, uh, say, the energy sector, and definitely what comes in is the mitigation first. Now, if we talk about agricultural or farming practices, that comes as a habit formation, that comes as an adaptation, and therein, uh, we try to find out natural solutions from the communities. We try to find out traditional knowledge, and that is a factor where time comes in. So this is a policy matter again, that whether to take it as a quick uh, solution or whether we can afford to uh, build in on the time that we invest. For example, Bhutan, Bhutan itself is a carbon negative uh, country and it is very, very much caring about its air and its forest. So when we talked about this agricultural waste management, which is a major cause for forest fire in Bhutan, uh, that was immediately taken up as a policy implication uh, a measure that how this agricultural waste uh, management can be uh, taken down uh, to uh, the commons. So that definitely depends on the policy. And I would like to say that the marginal commons, they do not probably understand the adaptation and mitigation, but definitely they understand which policy is coming to them and which policy is bringing them a handful of money so that they can survive uh, in this, in this uh, say, uh, dual uh, fight of climate and policy itself. So that's a very, very tricky question. That's a very uh, subtle, uh, fine line between adaptation and uh, mitigation that comes uh, when we talk about the commons. And that is one reason I thought that uh, I would like to uh, share the quote from Obama that how quick it is. We're the first generation to feel the effect of climate change. So that is that how uh, that much quickness is there in this particular problem. And we are the last generation, we can do something about it. That is the urgency of uh, understanding and uh, say responding to this particular problem. So uh, that was uh, basically my presentation. And uh, I would go back to Linda and look into uh, the questions that come up. Uh, thank you, Linda. Thank you yeah, very much for thank, this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Day. Um, I'm getting too soft. I didn't want to cut you off halfway through. You were over time, but that's all right. Um, now moving on to Dr. Long Quan Hui. Um, you have an intervention to make. Um, and again, I'll just say in the context of your work in case studies, what's a difficult challenge or barrier in linking adaptation and mitigation for community and local resilience. And if you could please keep your, your intervention under two minutes, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linda, I'll try my best. Um, first of all, thank you very much for having me. And uh, from a case study with the APN implemented during the year of the 2016 and 2017, we're trying to enhance the perception and capacity for uh, both national and provincial leaders and practitioners on GEG missing inventory to support the implementation of NAMAS and NDC and development of low carbon city in Vietnam. So that is the way that we're trying to use the kind of like a top-down approach, uh, organizational approach, uh, which begin with the change in the policies, uh, or at least propose policies and introducing a new practices on both adaptation and, mitiga and mitigation. And uh, the, with the case study, we, we, we did look at the synergy between the adaptation and, and, and the mitigation capacity building. Uh, we realized that, well, with the case study uh, and, and also our work uh, during the recent years, uh, we realized there's many different types of gaps uh, in capacity building, especially the trying to get the adaptation benefits from the mitigation and vice versa. First of all, is that we need to prioritize on institutional capacity building. And that is, I think, is, is a shared um, uh, knowledge and the shared uh, the concerns from, from, from different countries. And secondly, is a raising awareness at various levels on climate change issues and increase the involvement of national government institutions in capacity building activities. 
that is particularly right for Vietnam because we do not have that many governmental institutions involving with the capacity building strategy, even though that we did have a, 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 a capacity uh, uh, building strategy on climate change, but it's not implemented as well as expected, uh, which I will come back in, in, in a few seconds. And then we, of course, we need to promote the, uh, the best practices and, and sharing experience. And we want to ensure the long-term sustainability of capacity building activities for both adaptation and mitigation. And in, like many other developing countries, and recently that when we review our and update our NDC to submit it last uh, November, uh, we, we realize as a, that while well, the gaps for capacity building, especially on adaptation and mitigation synergy, uh, identify in the NDC of many different developing countries, including my, is first of all, is a lack of public awareness and support for climate action, both adaptation and mitigation. Secondly, is a lack of training in vulnerability and adaptation assessment and methodology and the perception on, on, on GHG emission reduction. And there's also the inadequate international support for building and retaining individual and institutional capacity on both adaptation and mitigation. And of course, the, the, the program on capacity buildings uh, spread it everywhere uh, that created the fragmentation on delivery channels and data and experts and, and research institution that unequal everywhere, not only in, within the countries, but I think that within region and internationally as well. And of course, that one last thing is that lack of strong and permanent institutional arrangement enabling environments for capacity building and synergy between adaptation and, 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 and mitigation there. So what we identify as the, 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 the burning needs for developing countries alike, including my and also many others, is, is, is to improve the, the capacity to understand, first of all, understand the synergy between adaptation and mitigation in a way is to understand the nature of climate problem in that specific country or, or, or that, uh, the, the area where people live and uh, understand that and, and such as implication of climate change on, on various economic sector, which is different everywhere and livelihoods and, and, and for, for, for human well-being in general. Uh, and that is a way to get the community to get more involved and uh, to improve the capacity to formulate and implement national actions. And that very much related to the policy made uh, within each country or even region in a country that uh, like Vietnam, we have different cities that they may have, the mega cities that may have their own climate change policies as well, uh, to, in order to limit the scale problem which may arise through, through the activities to respond to climate change, both adaptation and mitigation as well. And of course, uh, to limit the human, ecological, economic, and other societal impacts through the measures that they apply to mitigate the risks uh, on, of climate change risks and try to adapt to them. And uh, the, the, another one, which is a little bit more on the international side is the capacity to analyze the view consensus and to act, articulate the national interest in the UNFCCC uh, the process. Uh, because sing, sing um, uh, Marcus Cox in, in 2007, we have many different capacity building programs under UNFCCC, which countries, developing countries are trying to follow. So uh, with, with that, we would like to, to uh, what we propose within our case study and also what we always try to, to, to propose to the policy makers here in Vietnam is first of all, we need to understand the national and regional needs and, and challenges all the way down to the grassroots level at the community level. And that also is supported by UNFCCC as well, that we need to, to develop a country-driven capacity building that synergizes between adaptation and mitigation accordingly to the needs of the country and of the region. And we need to have a long-term sustainable system for capacity building. And I realize that not many country or even economic sector would have their own capacity building strategy that focus on their specific needs and social economic development strategies. And without that, that is not really going to the action of, of every economic sector or reasons. And we, we also need to realize the capacity of in-country capacity system and, and capacity suppliers. And, and, and that, that would be led to the role of of donors, of the government, of the people who involved as a, as a, as a capacity providers. 
And, and we need to have appropriate arrangement for that to realize the differences, the difference uh, uh, between adaptation and, and mitigation needs of each community and, 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 and individuals uh, all the way down to grassroots level. So uh, with that, um, I, I think that while between adaptation and mitigation, there's always some benefits that we can always exploit, but we haven't realized them yet properly for each reason and use our resources properly for that. And, and with that, I'd like to end my, my, my intervention here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hui. Uh, really appreciate that intervention. Um, we, time is moving on. We're a little bit behind schedule. Um, uh, let's have a really interactive session now. If I can ask everyone, all of our panelists, to turn on their cameras, um, then I'm going to share my screen and we're going to do a little bit of Mentimeter and respond to some of uh, some of the feedback on, on Mentimeter. Thank you so much for turning on your screens. Um, let me now just share my screen and uh, here we go. Okay. So our next question for the audience, as policy tools slash instruments, are NAP processes and NDC implementation important for local resilience? Um, that's a question to our audience. Um, I hope you're all there on Mentimeter. We have three responses so far. We have 60, I think 66 participants. Um, you can see the code if you haven't joined up with Mentimeter yet, you can see the code at the, at the top of the screen. Um, we have eight respondents, nine respondents. I think we could go for a few more. We have 10. Okay, it seems very important at 57%, 15 is coming in. So at least no one has said it's not important, at least no one yet. 16, there's 66 participants. Come on, people, you can, you can engage with Mentimeter. It's fun. 16 participants. We now have two more questions in Q&A, I believe. We can address them later. Okay, 17, let's try and go up to 20. See if we can get to 20. All right, we seem to be sticking at 18. So um, panelists, you see that 50% of our audience finds that um, policy tools and instruments are very important. 39% important and 11% somewhat important. And um, fortunately we have uh, no not important. So, um, oh, 42%, we've had another, another response. Let me stop sharing my screen and I would like our panelists, um, based on that, I would like to ask two of our panelists specific questions. And first up is uh, Vosita. So drawing on NAPs and NDCs implementation and the responses that you see, that, that you saw on, on the screen, we have 22 responses, but most are very important to important. Um, so responses from the audience on policy tools instruments, is community resilience increasing adequately uh, to address climate change impacts in terms of those NAPs and NDCs interaction? Tosita. Yeah, um, so, a lot of countries have a local um, level action integrated into uh, the NAP process. For example, I think um, Nepal was one of the pioneers, uh, local adaptation plans were developed, which focused on integrating local in uh, resilience into the national adaptation, well, at that point, NAPAS. But now this has been taken into account in countries at national adaptation plans and then also in DCs as well. Um, so when in just an example from Slack and Trust, uh, we work on risk management and linking it up with loss and damage and adaptation in the agriculture sector. And doing these actions, we focus at um, local level as well as pilot actions in districts in Sri Lanka. So we see a certain amount of resilience being built through these activities with policy interventions. And we try to have the evidence from the ground integrated into the NDC review process. So there's a link on uh, link to how local actions can benefit the policy actions at the national level. Um, but it's it's something that needs to be done consciously because it's very easy not to have this. So um, going forward, I hope this is something a lot of people would look into when uh, developing policies as well as project actions uh, at local and national levels. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Vasita. Um, and moving into another question, I'm going to ask, I'm going to pose to Professor Poulin. Um, how can climate action be designed at the local level to co-achieve mitigation and local resilience building? Professor Poulin. Yes. Uh, uh, essentially, again, I'm drawing from the case of the Philippines. And uh, it's, uh, I mean, to be able to really identify a more strategic action, you need a very robust vulnerability and risk assessment. And that's always uh, the starting point. Uh, so uh, that's where now uh, the earlier argument on integrating science and local knowledge comes in because uh, your understanding and vulner of vulnerability and risk uh, uh, becomes very crucial and that then becomes the basis for crafting your local action plan that will enhance now resilience because uh, once you have the plan it generates uh, interest it promotes collective action uh, it's a source of resource generation and so on uh, and so uh, you are then guided but again at the core of it is a robust vulnerability and risk assessment. So that's my short answer to that one. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Poulin. Now there's more interaction coming. I'm gonna share my screen again. And I'm um, gonna ask the next question to our audience. We now have 24 responses and fortunately, fortunately 54% and 38% respectively say very important and important. Um, moving on. Uh, to our audience, do you think current capacity and resources are sufficient for local resilience planning? Time to vote now. Um, I am going to put one minute on this vote. Okay, you have one minute. Your voting starts now. So nine say no, 10 say no. Do we get any not sures or yeses? 12 say no. I think it's looking pretty clear that um, there are not sufficient resources uh, for local resilience planning. Uh, planning, nor is their current capacity. Um, 16, no. It seems I gave you two minutes. Come on, audience, you can do this, 17. Okay, I think that's enough to get going on the next question then. Um, so let me just, should I stop, stop sharing my screen? It's really interesting. Um, yes, I will. I can always put it back up later. Uh, I've lost. Uh, help. I can't. I can't stop sharing my screen. Stop share. Okay, I got it. Yay. Fantastic. A little bit of panic there. Um, okay, so we want final uh, time is moving on. Uh, we did want to ask more questions. But I think what we're looking for now is is, is kind of final statements from each of the panelists before we move on to final statements from the audience because like i said this is a really important panelist audience in, uh, uh, interaction so based on the discussion today your experience and the response received from the audience noting that 21 have now said that um ca current capacity and resources are insufficient for local resilience planning um how does the dialogue move forward, particularly in terms of policy and climate governance for adaptation and mitigation synergy? And um, I'm going to ask you to be very short, less than one minute, please. And I'm going to pose this this to Dr. Dr. Huey, first of all. Dr. Huey, the floor is yours. Can you unmute, please? Hello, uh, it says my, my internet connection is unstable. Uh, can you repeat the, the, the last thing you just said, please? Okay, so um, given what we've discussed today and with the audience interaction, how does the dialogue move forward, particularly in terms of policy and climate governance for adaptation and mitigation synergy? And if you could respond within 
one minute, that would be fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think, well, first of all, that while it's not only for adaptation and, mit and mitigation synergy, and it's not only within the scope of capacity building needs here, uh, what we need to do now is, is, as I see from the list of attendees and panelists, that we are developing countries in the regions. And APM, for example, or IHS or other, uh, other organizations has been doing quite a good job on linking us together to share what we experience and, and what the best practices that we have done. And that, and, but the most important thing that we need to identify the needs for different regions and different communities there that, well, if we can share what types of nature of, 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 uh, of climate issues that we're experiencing in, in the recent years and in the, come, in the near future. And then we can, we can identify the needs there. And with that, of course, that there will be the scatter around in, in, in different uh, areas and different, different uh, organizations, communities as well. But the, at least that while we can find the share uh, the uh, concerns and also we can share the practices that we, we, we can do together there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Huey. Um, Dr. Benaya. Uh, thank you, Linda. So let me make my point. I think this, uh, when you come about uh, finance and capacity, I think it's are uh, very closely linked. So I would like to put it in other way. Like I think uh, what we first need to think about is how to make community build the capacity so that the communities at uh, local level can absorb the existing resources that are available. There are, it's not that finance is not though limited, but absorption capacity is very weak. So once we increase the level of absorption capacity, then the, the sources of other uh, financial channel will open up automatically in my view, because then you will ensure that the financial, the fi whatever finance will come will be, uh, will have risk risk. The issue of, at this moment is whoever wants to finance at the local level, they have a difficulty in assessing if their finance will have any impact or not. So we need such kind of system. And there the government and the NAP process comes in a way as a risk, uh, risk taker. I mean, they cushion the risk. So because if uh, somebody wants to like, for example, we are talking about the private sector these days, if private sector wants to invest in the local level, uh, how they can avert that risk. So at that case, the public finances, equally, uh, especially the adaptation finance that is coming will be a very handy. And in that respect, I think that I also appreciate a APN role in uh, providing a lot of uh, avenues for the capacity building, especially through this capacity building program, as well as the proposal writing that you are offering. So in that viewpoint, I think we need uh, more effort in uh, grooming the capacity at the local level to assess the existing resource rather than say, continue to say that resources are not available. Yeah, thank you. I would like to start here. Thank you so much, Dr. Binaya. Dr. Day, under one minute, please. Uh, yeah, Linda, thank you very much. I think uh, we need more of APN, like uh, capacity building in the regional level is very important because climate change, I do not think it's just a uh, political uh, boundary limited thing. And regional capacity building is very much important, which we are doing through the capable uh, framework. Uh, the second important thing, I would say that uh, resource budgeting at the community level is a very important aspect that we need to look into. Resource budgeting is actually resource amplification. So whenever the uh, say investment uh, opportunities are created, if such type of a resource budgeting is done, I think that gives a, a collateral for the uh, say for the investments. Third, but uh, not maybe the, the last, but not the least is uh, participation. When we talk about participation, uh, we should not be calendar ticking about the community participation, but whenever we are talking about any such decisions, that participation uh, should be very much important uh, as a policy decision uh, support system. And over that, if we plan our national policies, uh, not driven by the consumer economy, I think we would get a better result, a quicker result. Over to you, Linda. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Day. Sorry, I was just a little bit distracted there. Um, Dr. Shami, can you respond in under one minute, please? 
Thank you. Um, as I have, uh, you know, uh, talked a little bit uh, on this matter through my presentation, my answer to this question would be pretty simple. Uh, harnessing the power of nature to, you know, as much as possible to, to, to li link these uh, things, uh, to, to, uh, to link the mitigation and adaptation together to make the dialogue move forward. Because, you know, climate is, it is not that the climate is, has changed for the first time in nature. Climate has changed before also, right? So we, if we see geological time scales, climate has changed. It is anthropogenic climate change. Like now we are having is uh, human induced climate change. So uh, humans may lack the capacity. It's questionable. We are trying to have achieve this, but nature has its capacity to you know mitigate the uh, climate change impacts, right? So my answer would be simple: harness the uh, nature's power as much as possible and put it back, feed it back into our social system so that we can learn and, you know, integrate this natural power to, you know, uh, adapt to climate change and also mitigate climate change. So, yeah, that would be the quick answer. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, Vasita, would you like to come in under one minute, please? Um, so, two things I would like to highlight. One is focusing on the communities how communities could take their own initiatives and implement them. Because however much sometimes we like to engage with the community for them to implement these actions, there are issues of accessing finance, accountability, and transparent processes, which allows them to engage in project activities. So it has to be another entity working with them, but it would be great if uh, there could be governance systems and finance systems that are there in many processes that would allow the community-based organizations to play a key role in building in, um, resilience in communities and processes. Um, and then that would need capacity building to ensure this happens and skills developed. And also adding how policy processes like NAPS and NDCs could actually engage communities, not through other representatives, though we are vocal about their rights and, and what they need to access, but also having consultations at the ground level with farmers, fishermen, those who are vulnerable to climate change when developing these uh, policies and plans. Um, so these two things would be the key things I would like to highlight. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vasita. Really appreciate that. Professor Pullen, under one minute, please. Thank you so much. I have three key words that I just want to highlight <laughs> for one minute. One is enablers. So we continue to work with enablers it could be policy enablers, uh, technical enablers, uh, capacity development, and these are at all levels, regional, national, local. And APN, as I've said, uh, is uh, really doing a great job as far as this one is concerned. Second is we need, uh, in uh, parallel with enablers, is we need to work with champions on the ground uh, and also at different levels. Uh, so, uh, uh, we, there are a number of local local communities who can champion uh, climate resilient initiatives and so on. So we need to work uh, across different scale also with champions. And finally, we need to synergize. Uh, essentially, we have to work together collectively uh, as one community, as a region and so on. Uh, so enablers, champions, synergy are my three keywords. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor Poulin. I'm going to move quickly on now and get our more audience interaction. Um, I'm sharing my screen and uh, I'm going to move on to the next question. Uh, and this actually, it's a repeat question. Um, we asked this question at the beginning, um, adaptation and mitigation, it's not a question, it's a statement, adaptation and mitigation synergy can aid community and local resilience building. Um, I'd like our audience to respond to that, to see if there's any difference now between the statement asked at the beginning of the session and the statement asked now. So, um, okay, we have three respondents, five respondents. I think we'll try and get up to 20 and see if there's uh, any difference. We had 20 nine respondents, I think, in the first one. 22. Let's see if we can get up to 22. Okay, 16, 17. So 47, 42% agree, 37% strongly agree. 15% still not sure, and 5% strongly disagree. 
So there's not really much of a difference. Um, there are more panelists agreeing than strongly agreeing. It's a little bit more increased now, and I am going to stop there and move forward. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. So my last question in one to two words to our audience, what did you learn from this session? How can we move forward? This is going to come out in a bubble cloud that we can perhaps use as our key messages. So anything that you want to put in there in terms of how this dialogue can move forward for um, policy and climate governance for adaptation and mitigation synergy. Um, I think we have four minutes left. Uh, maybe we can spend one minute, still not seeing anything up here. I'm sure our audience must have something to, to, to say. Maybe you're having trouble with Mentimeter. We did have 22 participants in the last question, but it's okay. Oh, encourage, there you go, encourage. It's such a fantastic word. Nature-based solutions, inclusive, engagement, community integration, that's all fantastic. That's five respondents. We can get some more, come on folks. Okay, you can continue responding to that. I won't close it, but meantime, I am going to ask um, Mr. Genichiro Tsukada to say a few last words. Um, Tsukada-san, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Linda. Uh, distinguished speakers and panelists, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Genichiro Tsukada, director of the Secretariat of APM. I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to your active participation in this session today. As my colleagues, Dr. Linda Stevenson just summarized, I believe we have achieved a lot of outcomes uh, despite the limitation of time. Actually, there are many challenges related to increasing resilience at the local and community levels to the impacts of climate change, as well as increasing resilience through synergies uh, bet between mitigation and adaptation. As we discussed, we have discussed today. We hope that the outcomes of today's session will help to address and resolve uh, these challenges in the future. I'm pleased to mention that APN developed its new strategic plan at intergovernmental meeting uh, held last month. And the new plan showed that APN is a focus especially on activities in the field of climate change adaptation. APN is committed to contribute to addressing issues related to today's discussion by promoting relevant programs and activities in close collaboration with like-minded institutions. Once again, thank you so much for all, your, all of your active participation and hope to see you again in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tsukada-san. I'm just going to, oh, we've got one minute left, maybe I shouldn't, but please tune in to the key messages at the end of the day. We got lots of results um, from our Mentimeter and we will be sharing all of those key messages in the next session. I'm sorry I couldn't do that today, um, but thank you very much panelists. Your, uh, your presentations and your interactions were wonderful and uh, I would like to close out at that. Thank you very much, well done. Thank, Thank you, you Linda. Great facilitation. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. It was really great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very all. much, Dr. Day. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you all audience uh, for your Thank you, Linda. Bye. And Thank you, Vasita. Please tune in to the key messages session where hopefully we can, you know, summarize all of your interventions. Yeah, but it's okay. I think we're, we're we're not live anymore, but everyone is still here. Um, Louis, Louisa, how did we do? Good. So we are still live, and I just wanted to thank everybody for attending today's session as part of the seventh Asia Pacific Climate Change Adaption Forum. So please join us in the upcoming sessions, highlights of day one, and a special International Women's Day artistic exhibition hosted by the Embassy of Italy to the Kingdom of Thailand. You can find the link to join these sessions by returning to the sessions tab on the APAN Forum Conference community on Hubbelo. Within the community, you can explore the exhibitions as well as chat or set up meetings with other conference attendees. 
You can also join the conversation on social media using the hashtag APAN2020. Thank you once again for your participation and I'll see you in the next sessions. I do have to close out this session um, because it is still live. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. Um, to the thank panelists. You. And thank Dr. you. Take bye care. Bye. bye.